courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames are coming off a four-game losing skid, and we once again are here to talk about this team, and I think we have a lot to talk about this week. I'm Dan alongside Matt. Um, Matt, why don't we jump in before we give our thoughts and just talk about this week? I think it tells a story for us. Yeah, well, when you get one point out of four games, that's not a very good week. The Flames started the week, their first game after the trade deadline. We did our deadline show last week, and they came out playing Dallas in Dallas. I thought the start of this game was a good game. I thought that the uh, first five minutes were really high tempo. It felt like a playoff game, I thought, for that first five, maybe ten minutes. I thought that uh, the Flames' newest member, Chris Stewart, looked good in the first period. He made a great pass to Monaghan that might have been the Flames' best scoring chance. And I think in this one, I would say that it was Ben Bishop that kept the team alive, right? We've had our share of hot goalies against us, and we've had nights when we shouldn't have won because Smith kept us in. I think this is one of those nights for Dallas. What do you think? Yeah, and it's unfortunate that it happened, but Gillies did well enough. He, There was nothing that was particularly egregious about either goal. Uh, the second goal should have not... It should have been a penalty on Dallas for holding because that's how... Uh, Sagan got open, but uh, that's another story. Uh, but beyond that, it, it was a good effort. Unfortunately, hot goalie and lack of finish. One of the things that plagued the Flames this week is hitting the net, and they really failed to do that on many occasions throughout each of the four games. Yeah, I, I don't have much to fault the Flames on on this Dallas game. I thought, you know what, it was a good enough game for what it had to be. Um, and this was one where I think we just ran into a, you know, what is, it's not like Bishop is not usually a hot goalie, but this is what you get when you take on one of the best goalies in the league. Yeah, exactly. And it's unfortunate, and the Flames needed to find a way to score. They didn't, and they walk away with nothing. The next game, the following night, the Flames were on the road again, and this was almost a reverse of the game we saw before the trade deadline at home. If you remember on February 24th, the Calgary Flames beat Colorado 5-1, to and in this game back in Colorado's barn, the Flames lost 5-2. Uh, to two. So probably not the game that we wanted here. Um, I would... I would say this is tough to really judge as a hockey game because I thought there was some interest in officiating in this one that I think was probably throwing the flames off. And Matt, the question everyone's probably asking us, do we think the Goudreau, contra- the, uh, Goudreau suspension was warranted? Well, ejection, you mean? Uh, no. Uh, you know, when a guy gets cut in the throat area, it's just natural that he's not going to exactly be happy with anything coming near his throat. It's human reaction. You know, like it, you, everybody would be like, oh, you know, because you're coming to a very vulnerable area that's wounded. So it, the fact that Goudreau reacted, it's not like he fell down or flopped down or anything like that. I was like really that. questioning how that was even embellishment. No, it just looked like, oh, sticks in the way, ah, and then, <laughs> you know, Even if on. you hadn't been cut in the neck, I mean, your neck is such a sensitive area. You know, even if I came up to you and whacked you with a stick and you didn't have a neck cut, you'd put your hand on it too. Naturally, it's what we do as humans. We cover something when it hurts. Yeah, exactly. And I've watched that from multiple angles, and I fail to see how Johnny embellished. Yeah, uh, the, yeah that was not a very good... <laughs> call by the ref at all but Gaudreau was definitely justified for going off and he, you know he did deserve the 10 minute misconduct and getting tossed because you can't yell at the ref like that but the ref deserved every one of those words yep I was excited by this game in the beginning I mean we saw Michael back and score uh, at 14-19 in the first we saw Froelich come back in the second at 241. I thought at that point the Flames pretty much had the game. And I don't even know if I would say Colorado started playing a better game, but I think the Flames did what they always do, is that they get a little bit of opposition and they just fold it up and decide not to play hockey anymore. And I think between that and maybe the inexperience of David Riddick, I just think that this game got away from the Flames very quickly. And with every passing goal, the Flames just shut down a little bit more. 
Yeah, like the Kachuk penalty was obviously not a brilliant one to take, but okay, they scored. You're still leading 2 1. Then they quickly, less than a minute later, give up another one. Okay, it's tied. Time to get your stuff together. Then they give up another one a couple minutes after that. And it's like, uh, guys, uh, what are you doing? And then Nieto scored later on. And yeah, it's just one of those things that this team it, it is so mentally fragile. It is absolutely ridiculous. Like, it. It's like any one thing happens that does not go in their favor, and they just fold over entirely. And it's that's exactly what we saw here. Yeah, uh, it's frustrating because on paper this team should be better than they are, but well, you just look at the team and the stats that certain players have. Like this team shouldn't be in the spot that they are, but it is what it is. Then the Flames came home just long enough to grab some new clothes and head back on the road. And, oh, well, they were home. They might as well play a game. They took on the New York Rangers here at the Dome on the 2nd, their first game of the month of March. And this is a game I expected the Flames to win handedly. Lundqvist made 50 saves in his second straight start. And I would say you can't chalk this one up to the goalie like you could for the Dallas game. I just think that... Calgary came out in this one looking like they really didn't want to play. Yeah, like even though the Lundqvist made 50 saves, the Flames, I think after the first period, had like 12 shots on net or something like that, and like something close to 40 attempted shots. Well, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where you have to make the, the goalie's job difficult, and even though the Flames had 50 shots I wasn't really feeling any legitimate dangerous plays from the Flames and it's just frustrating because like once again the Flames are outplaying the Rangers in the first period heavily and the Rangers scored first the Flames tie it up but because they only had the one goal it's like they just oh well we did so much and we only got the one goal and there was no follow-up performance and then less than a minute into the second the rangers score and then once again the flames folded up and they were still firing shots but Corsi doesn't win you games and if you look at the breakdown here i'm on naturalstatric.com The Flames had very, very few what we would call dangerous scoring attempts. A lot of them from the outside and not a lot of shots in this game where you're going to fool a great goaltender like the Rangers had in net. And this is one of those games where you've it's like the Bishop game. You've got a good goalie. You've got to put a lot of pucks on net and a lot of pucks from the right places on net. You can't just kind of aimlessly fire towards the net hoping it goes in. Yeah, it's not like you're playing a goalie from Edmonton. You know, where you can just throw any random Al puck Montoya? towards the net. Yeah, you can just throw any puck randomly towards the net and they'll likely go in. So, you know, it's just so frustrating because this team is better than this and yet they're not. Something I've noticed all year and especially this week, and I've mentioned it to you a few times over the last couple seasons, but especially this season, this team's inability to seemingly get guys open in front of the net and it's costing us rebounds. Every time I'm watching the the team, especially when I'm there live watching the team, I'm noticing that guys are not in front of the net. They're too far on one side or the other and we're putting pucks on the net and we saw, I think, a lot of this in the Pittsburgh game but there's nobody there to get the second or third shot. It hits the goalie, it comes off, it goes to another player, and we go back the other direction. Or we've got to wrestle for the puck again with another player out front. This team needs to be better at getting a guy in front who well, can stay open. Or the, he'll be in front, but his stick's all tied up. And well, that, look at I think, uh, the Rangers game. The one goal that the Flames scored, Kachuk took a shot, it hit Lundqvist, then Frelik took a shot, Lundqvist saved that, and it was kicked out to Kulak who had the wide open net. But if Frolik wasn't there in front of the net, that goal does simply doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So to illustrate your point exactly, if there's people in front, good things happen. But uh, 
as you're saying, like that's a a rarity, for, unfortunately, for most of the season. And I've been I've been kind of tracking it when I've been up in the press box watching the games, and most of where I'm seeing players stand in front of the net is almost way back at the hash marks. Like you can't be that far out if you're trying to pick up a rebound. We need a guy right in front, and we need a bigger guy, a Furland, a Brower, someone who can fight his way through the traffic that's going to be there. And well, like. I don't know. I learned this in Pee Wee hockey. Like, why are we not getting this as professionals? Well, that's the thing. Like, what part of the reason why Troy Brower specifically, because you mentioned him, that he struggled when he was successful in Chicago, when he was successful in St. Louis, when he was successful in Washington, it was because he was standing right in front of the net all the time. And he would muck up everything, and he'd be the one to dig out the loose bucks in front of the net and bang them in. That, that's how he got his goals, and he hasn't been able to do that this year or last year, and unsurprisingly, he's had his two worst seasons of his professional hockey career. When I played hockey, I was a terrible scorer. I couldn't score worth a darn, but you know what I used to do? I used to stand in front of the net, I would get that puck, and I'd put it on the net, or I'd pass it back to someone who I knew could get the goal. Like You need that guy, and usually that's your center to sort of direct that traffic, but I think that a lot of what the Flames are missing is some of those fundamental pieces. Put a big guy in front of the net who isn't going to get a stick tied up, who isn't going to get confused by what's going on, and that's going to help you at least get a couple more dangerous shots. When you're going to shot from that close, you're going to score a lot more. Exactly. Well, let's talk about the last game of the week. I think this is probably the most telling one. The Calgary Flames back on the road after their quick trip home to change their underwear for another three-game uh, streak and the first game in, on this road trip against arguably in the last couple of years one of the best teams in the NHL. I mean they're second in the Metropolitan Division now, but I'd say one of the one of the teams that you would measure yourself by as a playoff team, and that is the Pittsburgh Penguins. And the Flames got one point out of this game, the only point all week in a four to three loss in overtime to the Penguins. If you talk to the Flames, they will say that there's a lot of good things in this game. They thought it was a good effort, and I would probably agree. But at the same time, good efforts don't win you Stanley Cups. Good efforts when you need two points and you don't get two points is worth absolutely nothing. And at this point, the Flames, they have 15 games left. Now they're in a position where they have to win probably 11 of them to make the playoffs. And... You know, good efforts. Well, that, you know, great. Good for you. Moral victories. Yay. Awesome. It's like when Edmonton beats us. It doesn't mean anything to them. No, exactly. Like, who cares? If you miss the playoffs, and especially when you don't have a first-round pick, well, goody for you. You had a good effort. Yay. Awesome. Yay. I, I bet Trill Living's now wishing that he put a condition on that so he could defer to next year. Yeah, the well. first rounder. It, nobody expected the team to be this pathetically bad. Before we're done talking about the week, I think, you know, trying to get something good out of this week, the Flames, I did think, looked okay against Pittsburgh. They came out ready to play. I think that it is a good measuring stick that they can do this, but I watch a game like this and I say, okay, so we can do it. So why aren't we? Like, I was almost more mad at the end than anything going – great, we can play this kind of hockey. If we would played this kind of hockey for every game we've played so far, all 67 of them, we'd be in a much better position. So why can't we do this night in and night out? Well, there are the two separate uh, things. The general manager, his job is to ensure that the team has enough talent in the organization. And if you look at the Flames roster... They have 420 goal scorers. They have five excellent defensemen, an all-star goaltender. There, there's not really too much to complain about. Yeah, they could use some help on the third and fourth lines, but most teams need help on the third and fourth lines. Like, that's not the be-all and end-all. Like, if your fourth line sucks, that should just mean that your fourth line sucks and that you just don't play them very much when the games matter. <laughs> So it's one of those situations where if the assembled talent is fine 
and they're performing well. It's not like all of the players are having horrible seasons. Like they're basically on their career, either career bests or heading towards the that general area. So because of that, you have to look at the other s side of the coin, and that that is what we discussed back in December was the coaching staff. And this is the famous episode where Matt spent an hour going off on Gullitson. Yeah, and if you look at the demeanor of coaching staffs that are successful, take the Pittsburgh Penguins. Mike Sullivan and Glenn Gullitson have the same organizational philosophy on how to play hockey. Their systems are identical. There is no difference between how Calgary plays and how Pittsburgh plays. It, in terms of the style of play. Yet, the one main difference is is that Glenn Gullitson is a very passive person. It, it, and Sullivan, he's always a very intense, feisty, will yell at everybody, basically, type of guy. Very intense. And the Penguins have won two Stanley Cups in a row. You look to Chicago, Joe Quenville. He is a hothead. Daryl Sutter, he's a hothead. Dave Tippett, when he was with Arizona, he always got the most out of his team, and he was very intense in how he delivered it. And from watching games over the last 20 years, it the teams that tend to underperform their talent level, the coaches tend to be more gentlemanly in nature. And... It's one of those things that you need to be able to basically kick your team's ass when they need their ass kicked. And Gullitson, went, and it's even evident this season, when he did blow his load in January, throwing the stick into the crowd and all that, the Flames responded and went on a seven-game winning streak and played their best hockey of the season. But he doesn't have that intrinsically in him to do that game in and game out. And you look at Bob Hartley. His system was crap. Because <laughs> the Flames system was just... He, you could pick it apart. But he was a very intense person. And the Flames were consistently playing at their peak level, even if their team was not very good. I'd like, say they probably got more out of some of those Hartley teams than they should have. Yeah, like you look at the year that we made the playoffs, like I still do not know how the Flames made the playoffs that year in 14-15. And if it wasn't for Kari Ramo getting hurt in 15-16, they probably would have made the playoffs that year too because it was just the horrible goaltending from Jonas Hiller that sunk the team. And it's just frustrating because like most of the systems around the NHL are – pretty much the same like there's differences but it's not like the left wing lock that uh certain other coaches uh used in the 90s where it was vastly different from everybody else or the trap teams under la Mer with new jersey it, everybody kind of uses a, the same generic template so it comes down to the coaches themselves and how they interact with the players and there are some coaches that always consistently get more from their teams and some that get less. And Gullitson, when he was with Dallas, he consistently got less out of the stars than their talent level dictated. With Calgary, last year we should have been better than we were. This year we should be better than what we are. And it's sometimes it's not what you're teaching, it's how you're teaching it. And it's like the players just they're just not being able coaxed in the right way to get the most out of themselves nhl head coaches are more than just an x's nose guy and that's the thing that gully brings to this team is he's a great x's nose guy he's a great hockey strategy guy and analytics guy and to me those are the roles that are great assistant coaches you need that one guy who can give you those analytics and feed those to the head coach 
The other part of the job is almost being an HR manager, knowing how to motivate your employees, knowing how to, as you mentioned, kick their butt, knowing how to get them in gear, whether that's, you know, some guys need to be yelled at, some guys need positive reinforcement, everyone needs something different, and you need to know how to manage each one of those pieces. And I feel like that's the thing that when you look at our coaching staff, we're missing. We're missing that HR manager right now. Yeah, and and that's why... We got a bunch of guys who are great X's and O's guys. Yeah, and... Like the intellectually, what the Flames are trying to do is the same thing that all the successful teams are doing. It's just that they're not being successful, not because of the talent, but because of how it's attempting to be used and it's not working properly. And it's just frustrating because this team. Like, as I said, they have 420 goal scorers, and in this era, like, it, I think that the Flames may be the first team in the last decade, to, if the, they do miss the playoffs, to miss the playoffs with 420 goal scorers on their team. Like, it's just, it's not like the rest of their team is absolutely terrible outside of four guys who can put the puck in the net either. So, it's just so frustrating because this team could be a very good playoff team if they were on the right page with each other and everybody seems out of sorts and out of sync and it's just not working. And I know where you're coming from with the coaching thing and I know you're very unhappy with the current coaching staff and I don't want to say the coaches aren't at fault but I think at this point there's almost equal fault between coaches and the roster and I think if the Flames don't make the playoffs this year we're going to see at least one big roster move done over the summer because I think I think it's almost like when Dion was here and there was the Jerome and the Dion camp and he had to move Dion out to make things harmonious. I don't think the dressing room is not harmonious, but I think you almost need to shake up the roster because I don't think this is all coaching. I think there's definitely an aspect of it that is coaching, but I think at some point you have to say the roster that's on the ice is not getting the job done either and we need to make some big moves to change that. Oh, I agree. And like I think the, the Flames do need to move a defenseman out for another scoring forward. And I think the, that's the next domino to fall. It's just... I think you also send a message if you move a guy like TJ Brody, who's sort of the, you know, Calgary son, to say, oh, crap, if he can move, anyone can move. Yeah, he's the second longest serving Flame, I think, or third behind Backlund. Yeah, so. he's, I mean, he's only ever played for the Flames. Like, he's sort of that, you know, homegrown guy. Everyone loves him, and it's like, crap, if he's gone, I can be gone. Yeah, um, it's just frustrating because... Uh, you never like to see a team waste a year when they didn't need to. And it looks like the Flames are heading towards wasting a full year when, especially with the Flames contract situations, like they have a lot of cheaper contracts that, you know, like this is their time where they should be actually doing stuff. And like to miss the playoffs in a year like this, especially when you don't have a first round pick. It's extremely tough, and the Flames are kind of backed themselves into a corner and are kind of in a major problem right now. One thing that's interesting to me is I think we it's a it's been a weird season if you think about it. There's been no NHL head coach lose his job yet, and I don't think you see one lose his job now. Like there's no point in changing coaches. Usually we see one or two lose their job, but I think we could see some high profile names become available in the summer. Let me throw out a, a name for you. I can see Chicago moving on from Quenville. What would you think about bringing Joel Quenville in as the next head coach of the Calgary Flames? It, I'd say yes to Quenville. I'd say yes to Daryl Sutter. I'd say I don't yes think Sutter to comes back. Dave Tippett. No, neither do I. My worry about I'd, Dave Tippett is it's again it's Tree bringing in the you know the Arizona network. Well, the thing is, Arizona. Like, there, the entire time Tippett was there, Arizona was a crap team. Like, because they were a budget team, and they couldn't afford to keep... Like, they were just basically skirting the cap floor. And yet, they were consistently playing well above their overall abilities. And you take a team that, like Calgary, who actually has legitimate talent... Like, uh, the only player on Arizona that was any good was really Shane Doan and, like, Redeem Verbata. Like, there wasn't really a ton of scoring depth on that 
team, and yet that one year they went to the conference finals, and that's largely due to the coaching staff getting more out of them than what was there. So if you transplant that type of a coach into Calgary or any other team, frankly, that has a lot of talent on it, and they're able to replicate that, then you're looking at some good results. It's just, you know, uh, it, Arizona was really, really, really bad for like the last four years that he was there. I've sort of changed my tune on this. Last time we talked about this, I said I think uh, Tim Hunter will be the next head coach of the Calgary Flames. What I can see the Flames doing is, for better or for worse, moving on from the coach over the summer because it's an easy scapegoat. I mean, you know, there's an old saying the coaches are hired to be fired. I can see them bringing in a, a winning coach like a Dave Tippett or uh, Joel Quenvel or even someone like a Dan Blisma. I could see coming in. And then what I see is I see um, um, the farm team coach, the Stockton head coach, being promoted to an assistant coach. I think we have a lot of young players coming through here now where you want that guy at the NHL level. He knows these young guys. He's played with these young guys. He's He's got that feel of their development. And I could see a guy like a Tim Hunter then being put in charge of Stockton. That could very well be. I think that the next coach needs to, if the Flames move on from Gullitson, needs to be more of a, a intense person than a passive person like even like bob hartley was more of an intense person and just to get more out of the team like even if the players aren't exactly happy but they're playing well then hey good <laughs> well i think the other thing too you know you never i don't want to say you never you rarely see stanley cup teams led by players who've never made it Right, you always have the veteran guys who've been there more times. I mean, yeah, maybe you have your one star guy, but if you look down the rosters, you've generally got a veteran goalie, veteran defenseman. You know, you might have the star forward or whatever. And I think the Flames are the same way. Is yeah, Gully could probably be made into a good coach, but you need a team like Edmonton who has more patience to do it. I think if the Flames want to be a contender, you have to bring in a coach who understands how to build that winning environment and who has a couple more Stanley Cup rings. And, you know, I think a guy like a Quenville, a guy like a Tippett, you know, they, they've been around, they've won, they're seasoned coaches. And when you have a team who isn't in a rebuild, you don't bring in a, a you know, a rookie coach or a very inexperienced head coach to win you a Stanley Cup. You bring in a, just like you'd bring in a, you know, the deadline, you'd make your move for your veteran guy to win you the Cup. You need the veteran coach, too. Yeah, and there are exceptions like Sullivan in Pittsburgh, but... I think at that, that point, though, you could have coached that Pittsburgh team and still won a Cup. Yeah, well, give me a break. You, you have Crosby, Malkin, Kessel, like, and and others. Well, that's it. I, don't, I don't think the coach did much besides stood on the bench yeah. and looked good for that team. So it, it's just frustrating to see this team struggle as much as they are, especially because they, like as you said in the Pittsburgh game, like why aren't they playing like this all the time? And like if, like we beat Pittsburgh earlier in the season. Like, we can do it. It's just... My my uh, big knock on Gullitson, and I'm not as unhappy with him as you are, I think, yeah, they'll probably make a change for better or for worse because it's an easy change to make, but my big knock on Gullitson is he seemingly doesn't know what he wants to do or he sees success and he goes, no, I don't want that. I know in my head what I want. And I think his line matching is what I'm talking about or not his line matching, but his line, his use of his lineup. You'll see a line that gets some traction. I think Sam Bennett, for example, has looked great on the first line, but then Furland comes back and says, nope, back to what I want, which is Furland up there. And I think a lot of other coaches would say, we see some interesting, let's play with it, let's try it some more. And we often see guys start to spark something mid-game, and next game it's, nope, back to what we were. Yeah, and this uh, uh, somebody on Reddit actually uh, brought up an article uh, back when the Flames hired Gullitson, and it, one of the main concerns was his player usage. Because that was one of the concerns that they had when he was the Stars coach. And it's just... 
it it nothing's really changed like it's still the single-minded my way or the highway when and not being flexible to like having a different approach to things like as you said that uh Bennett he was doing fairly well looked like he was actually a top six forward for the first time pretty much this season other than that one stretch in December and then oh Furlan's back yay uh, or Stewart gets acquired let's throw him there instead and it's like well well and I was okay to try that because if you remember he didn't put him there all game he started him there and he moved him around to see where he had chemistry but I think you know you start to see some chemistry and then it's like nope back to where we were we can't have that chemistry there and it's confusing to me why he doesn't at least try things for another game or two. Yeah. Um, I think if you look at what the Flames have done, let's look at the front office. They brought in Brian Burke, who, whether you like him or hate him, you have to agree Brian Burke is a seasoned GM. He's a seasoned hockey guy. He's worked for the league. He's worked for you know various teams. You might not like him. You might not like his hair, but he's a knowledgeable hockey guy. And then they brought in a not-so-seasoned general manager to work with Burke. And I don't think the Treliving experiment would have happened if it wasn't for Burke being there. I think you needed that experienced you know, mentor for him. And I feel they tried to do the same thing on the bench. They brought in Gullitson as the inexperienced head coach, and they put him with Dave Cameron, who I think they were hoping to be the Burke to... Gully's, you know, inexperience is true living. And I don't think that Dave Cameron ended up being the mentor they were looking for. I think if they do decide to keep um, Gullitson as the head coach, you need to bring in that seasoned, almost the role that's floated now as associate coach, that sort of grizzled veteran guy to be his right hand and say, look, I've done this. Here's why this isn't going to work. Yeah. And one of the things that back in December that like I was specifically criticizing was the usage of the players and like you mentioned Brian Burke well the team is built in a very truculent fashion and yet the I need a t-shirt that says that I have truculence and y- you look at the team though and they don't play a physical game whatsoever and it's like well why are like seven of the players on the team if you're not going to use them in the right fashion like it's just it doesn't make any sense and that's part of the disconnect and that rigidity of playing things like it has to be done exactly this way because this is the way I want it done with no flexibility on the actual personnel you have like, the Flames aren't a team like Pittsburgh where it's all flash and no physicality. And, uh, like, the Flames are more built like Los Angeles or Chicago where you muck it up and <laughs> beat the other team up. And we just simply don't play that style. And I don't want to say that Hartley was a great coach because I think Hartley had his own issues. Oh, yeah. His wanna... system was horrible. Like, give me – don't – even you don't even need to argue there like it the defensive system there was horrible for uh, under Hartley it was not done well but one of the things I appreciate about Hartley was if you didn't play well he'd sit you down I mean we had Goudreau sit on you know get scratched one game you know like he was sitting guys down and he also gave opportunities I think as a motivator to guys like Josh Juris to guys you know who probably wouldn't have got that call up otherwise and I think that's another thing with Gully is he goes the same well too often and there's a number of guys who probably should have sat for a couple this season and you go wow he's playing terrible why is he back in the lineup I know like look at Matt Stajan for um it's unfortunate but for most of the season he hasn't been an NHL caliber player and yet he's played 55 games I think this season and like it realistically he should have played maybe 15 at this point and that's not to be overly harsh i think stage would have been a great 13th forward yeah. this year and instead he's out there all the time and it's frustrating because like there's so many players on this team that could have been swapped out like garnett hathaway after his awesome december once he cooled off, should have been reassigned back to Stockton. 
and you know promote Poirier or Shin Carrick or Klimchuk or somebody else. Try some other player, but instead, you know, he's still here and. Yeah, we don't know how much that's the coach or the GM, though. Yeah, but it's one of those things that, especially because he's not hitting, that's the main problem with that His that player specifically is that he's a very physical player. Like in Stockton, he would be hitting everybody all the time. And th he that's how he'd create space on the ice for his line mates. And he comes up to Calgary and he can't hit anybody. And... He was briefly when he was doing well, and then that stopped. And and we we don't know if that is necessarily uh, Hathaway or if that's instructions he's been given from the coaching staff. So I don't think we can necessarily lay that all on Hathaway. No. Maybe they've said, "Hey, we want you to try and play this other game." But you're you're right. I mean, it is a coaching issue, and, and the Flames of all teams, and this coach especially with the Flames. You go, hmm, that's – and, I mean, I'm not saying I'm a head coach, but you go, why are they using the roster in that way? And of all Flames coaches I can remember, this coach especially, he just – it's like on day one of the season he made up his roster. And it's like this is carved on my arm or tattooed on my arm, and I have to go back to it because we can't change it. And it's like, why are you not more flexible? And maybe that's just his style. Maybe that comes with experience, but that's one thing I'm hoping if we have a more experienced coach – we'll see a little bit more of and less just rolling the lines more. You know what this line's doing well, give them more ice time and it just some confusing coaching moves. Well, you look at Quenville in Chicago, like for the longest time, Taze and Kane were together, but then he separated them because they weren't quite working as well together and thought, Hey, we can get two lines worth of good out of it instead of just one. But when those lines are struggling to score. He puts the, those two guys back together again. Even if it's just for a game or a period, just to try and get something going. And he's willing to modify how things are done in order to get the best results. Because it doesn't matter how you get there, as long as you get the win, who cares? And that flexibility is not there with the Flames. Well, I, th I think that we can both agree that Coach probably changed in the offseason. The question is, who do we change him to? And that'll be an interesting storyline to watch. If this team doesn't make the playoffs, I think, you know, that'll be one of the first changes we might see. I think that, um, like, literally the, the day after the season ends, the coach gets fired if the Flames miss the playoffs. I think you're right. I think the coach might get fired right away. I don't think we'll see a replacement until closer to July 1, just because we need to see what everyone else is going to do with their pieces first. Coaching changes are a bit of a chess game. You don't want to hire a guy and then two days later go, crap, we wish we had that guy. So I can definitely see the Flames firing the coach and maybe the whole coaching staff and then waiting on you know replacement. And there's no rush to replace him. No. As long as you have one by October next year, hey, awesome. <laughs> that's about that's the only thing that matters is as, as long as by the time the season gets underway next year that you have somebody that's a replacement, that's the important thing. So Matt, the I, I hate to mix sports here, but uh, Bill Parcells, famous football coach, former uh, American League, National League coach, has a saying, and he says, "You you are what your record says you are. You can say we look great on paper. You can say we've had you know some great games, but you are what your record says you are. And right now, the Flames' record says they're losers. They've lost four in a row. They can't seem to win the games they need to. It's been a tough week for the Flames, and right now the Flames sit with 74 points, three points back from L.A. for the last wild card spot, 15 games left in the season. Realistically, right now, do the Flames have a... a sh I mean, there's always that, yeah, miracles could happen, but looking realistically, do the Flames have a shot at, at a postseason berth this year? If I was to actually bet money, no, I wouldn't think that they do. Because, and it's not because of their play of late, it's the how they're losing. And it's like the coach has lost the room, it looks like, and nobody's playing on the same page. Everybody's on their own, doing their own thing, and nobody seems to have any pushback at all. 
and I the Flames have the easiest schedule of any of the teams in either league's playoff hunt, and I still don't think that the Flames will even like this week. The Flames are playing Buffalo, Ottawa, and uh, early next week Edmonton. I don't see the Flames getting more than two points out of those three games. On paper, I mean, if you look at the teams vying for that Western Conference wildcard spot, the Flames should make it because they have the most divisional games and they have easy opponents around that. Like, it's almost like the, the schedule is tilted in the Flames' favor. Yeah, they should under normal circumstances, but I just don't think they have it in them to win. Uh, even though talent-wise, they do, but the team as a whole, I don't. I think they're broken, and I don't think that they'll put it back together. There's just no time to do it. It's interesting you mentioned the coach losing the room, and I don't know if this is just you know players talking to the media, or if I'm getting the wrong sense. But every time I've been down the dressing room as a media person talking to the players after the games. I get a little bit of a lackadaisical attitude. You get the, you know, guys, you didn't do well tonight. What needs change? And you kind of get the shrug and we have to be better. And it's like, of course you have to be better. You lost a game, but how do you be better? And I fear that the the ball just kind of keeps getting kicked down the road. Well, we got to be better. Oh, we lost again. We got to be better. And I think we're running out of time to be better, as you said. And yeah, we've lost Smith and that's definitely a, a problem. I think, to me, if you look at it, the Flames used to have Smitty there who could go 60 minutes. And I think he kept the team from falling apart a lot. It'd be, guys, let's do this. We can still get in this. I can make some saves. You know, let's keep it together. And it feels like losing Smitty, this team's folding up quickly in games when they get behind. I don't know when Smitty's going to be back, but I agree. I think it's too little too late at this point. I think by the time the Flames get going, unless they can go on like a a 10-game tear... I think they better start booking their tea times for April. Yeah. And, like, I'm reminded of an article that I re- read back in 2003. And it was uh, with Babcock when he was coaching the Ducks. And uh, it was referencing uh, him going on the ice in the first game of the season. It, it First practice. And he went into the room and he said... Well, this tonight is the most important game of the year. And all of the players just looking at him like, uh, did I hear him right? Like, is he on something? <laughs> but he wanted them to treat every single game as the most critical game of the year. And they went all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals and were one win away from actually winning the Cup on a Ducks team that wasn't that good. Mind you, Jaguar stood on his head that playoffs, but it still, like, it, it's that approach, though, that you have to treat every single game like it is a playoff game, and from day one. And we've seen for the last 20 years with the Calgary Flames, where October and November, they don't even care, it seems, as long as that they're not like 20 points out type of thing by December, they're good to go. And okay, we'll start playing now because the games matter. And that approach is what leads to things like this. Their lackadaisical start in October and November, like, eh, we'll make it up later. Well, the points in October matter just as much as they do now. They count for just as many. And yet... They coughed up so many points in the early part of the year that they could have used now, and that lackadaisical attitude is why we're here. The big issue I'm worried about is, you know, the Flames are on a four-game losing streak. When you get on those kind of streaks, you tend to, you know, hold the stick a little tighter. You tend to make more conservative plays. You're thinking too much about winning, and I think that's often how you don't win is you're, you know, trying to make the right move. So instead of just making a move and I hate to say it, I think that the flames are going to go into a bit of a spiral this month. And, you know, I don't want to see it as a fan, but I can see this team having to get worse before things get better. I, there's games that we should win. We should win, you know, Edmonton, we should win Arizona. And I just see things getting bad here and teams sort of, 
like vultures kind of picking on the, the carcass of the Calgary Flames. And when you start losing those, that's going to get in the players' heads. So I think a lot of it's just going to be the psychological side is going to kill this team. Yeah, and like realistically, they should have beat Dallas. They should have beat Colorado. They should have beat the New York Rangers this week. They should have. All three of those te- games were winnable. They beat themselves. And it is what it is. Like, if they had even won two of those games, the Flames were in a playoff spot. But they didn't, and it is what it is. So, you know, it's interesting as a guy, you were saying at the beginning of the season, this team had Stanley Cup potential, and to now be looking at it as crap, we're on the outside, and we may not be able to even make it to round one. I mean, Daryl Sutter said, all you got to do is make it to the dance. Once you're in the playoffs, anybody can win. But now looking at it as crap, we might not even make those playoffs. You really think, like, you know, and we've talked about it here, and we'll talk about it more, you know, in our postseason wrap-up as well, but where do the where do the wheels fall off this cart? Well, that uh, when I was making that statement, I was basing it on the appraisal of the collected talent that's on the team. And you look at the team, there's 420 goal scorers, Five excellent defensemen and Brett Kulak, who's doing very well this year himself, and an all-star goaltender. Like, there, what more do you want? Like, you you look at it and the team is assembled to be a it should be a competitive team. It should be, and so you just look at all those parts and well, that should be good, but. You know, if things happen. Like, Yager was expected to contribute more than he did. It's unfortunate he got hurt. Versus he got hurt. And, you hurt. know, every, every team has one of those seasons where crap just goes wrong. And I'm hoping this is the one for the Flames where we just write off to, you know what? Stuff just didn't go right. Yeah. And that next year we say, you know, okay, what didn't go right? How do we prevent those things? And let's go do it. Yeah. Well, Matt, talking about some of those pieces, there is some good promising news on the injury front. Uh, we talked about Mike Smith earlier. He's back on the ice. He's skated recently, and Coach Gullitson says that he, his skates have been promising. No ETA for when he'll return, but he is on the ice with the team on the road trips. So that's a good thing. Uh, Chris Versteeg is back on the ice, which he hasn't been for a while. He has a yellow no-contact jersey on during his practices, which means you're getting pretty close i've heard estimates for him being mid-march coming back which would really help the power play if we do get him back and lastly the newest flame uh nick shore who's been given jersey number 25 freddie hamilton's old jersey number he's he was sick for a while i don't know what he was sick with but he's finally joined the team did you ever think that Nick Shore and Dougie Hamilton are going to be instant friends because they can bond over one fact? Dude, your brother was a flame? Wow, my brother was a flame too. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah. What are the odds? <laughs> so maybe those two will be fast friends. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's going to be nice. I think the flames need well, Mike Dougie, Smith back. Dougie needs to change his number to 22, so that way each is wearing their brother's jersey number. There you go. Maybe do that for like the last game of the season or something. Yeah. Speaking of jersey numbers, I know we don't want to talk too much about other teams, but I heard uh, when Patrick Maroon got traded to New Jersey, he considered wearing number five, so jersey would say Maroon 5. <laughs> oh, God. He didn't do it, but he said he considered it. Yeah. Well, I've um, always been disappointed that Miroslav Shatan never wore the number six. <laughs> Satan 666. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Well, maybe he could wear 66. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, you know, these three pieces coming back, Smith, Versteeg, and Shore getting in there, I think the more we've got, the more those, you know, veteran pieces, Shore, um, Versteeg, the more those guys are in the lineup, the better I think the Flames have a chance of doing. So I'm glad to hear that they're all coming back. I do think the Flames ran into some injury trouble, but you have to be deep enough to work through that. And, you know, we can debate later how that's worked. But that does bring me to a question, talking about injury trouble. Um, Looking at the young goalies. So, you know, we will talk more about the actual goaltenders next week and what we think of them. But do you think so far in this road trip, the goalies to me are taking a lot of flack? Do you think it's the fact that young goalies haven't played well for the Flames? Or do you think it's this team hasn't played well for their young goalies? I think it's... 
partially the the goalies are a little shaky. Like some of the goals that Gillies has given up and Riddick has given up have been not high quality goals. But to me, I'm getting what I expect from an AHL call up goalie. Yeah, like they they haven't done anything particularly egregious, and they've had fairly decent starts. None of them are like you're not getting shutout caliber hockey, but give me a break. Like any starting goaltender in the NHL is not going to be awesome every game, so it is what it is. It's just that the team has lost all confidence in itself ever since Smith went down, and they've just played terrible in front of them, and they're hanging the kids out to dry. I think, and and we'll talk more about the individual goalies next week. I think you're getting what you expect. I mean. Riddick is, for all intents and purposes, still an AHL call-up. Yeah, he's been here for a while. Yeah, I'll probably be the backup. But he was a mid-season call-up from the A to replace a terrible uh, Eddie Lack. And he's had 16 start. He's had 16 games so far. Gillies is at seven games. I think I'm getting what I expect from AHL call-ups. I mean, we essentially, if you look at it, we lost our NHL goalies. We've called up the AHL goalies. And our ECHL goalies are playing in the AHL. Like... Everything's kind of shifted one to the left. I think I'm getting exactly the games I expect from these guys. They're young. They need to learn. They need to learn positioning. There's a few times you can tell they're not used to the speed or the quickness of the NHL game. But to me, I think if I look at all on a whole, I'm getting desired performance from the goalies. I'm not getting it from the skaters. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yep. I'm not saying the goalies are great. I'm not, but you're not expecting John Gillies or David Riddick to, you know, keep you in a game. You're not expecting them to steal a game like you would Mike Smith. You're expecting them to just, you know, be adequate at keeping it. the puck out of the net. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we're doing okay with, with where we are, and I think it's this team around them that I don't want to say doesn't have the confidence, but doesn't have that veteran leader that we've seen Smith be. Um, and based on that, we're going to talk next week about the individual goalies, about their performance, and about what might happen with the Flames net mining situation next year. So the topic we want to ask you guys in our poll this week is based on what you've seen, who should be the Flames' backup goalie next season? We've got five options. We can, we can have David Riddick, John Gillies, Tyler Parsons, Mason McDonald, or maybe you think the Flames need to look outside the organization for that spot. So go ahead and vote for that. Uh, question you can let us know what you think on twitter or at fireside podcast on facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat or on our website at firesidechat.ca and we're going to talk about this next week but it'd be nice to see what you guys think when we get into that and uh you know who you think is going to get that job i think coming into this the flames thought one thing and i'm starting to think the flames might be changing their mind but we'll talk about that and while we're talking about the poll Let's wrap up last week's poll. We did our live trade deadline episode last week. A lot of fun. Thanks for those of you that tuned in live on YouTube. We asked you guys what you thought about the Flames deadline moves. And 57% thought the prices were insane at the deadline. The team did well for what they got and what they gave up. 28% of people thought the Flames needed to do more. And 14% of people thought that they were neutral. They had no real thoughts on good or bad either way. Nobody picked the option. Good pickups. We gave a very little. Great job. So seemingly positive sentiment. Some people thought maybe we could have done more. I think still looking at this, you know what, for what we got, I think it's going to turn out well for the Flames. Well. So, Matt, um, last question I'll ask you this week. Now that Furland is back in the lineup and the coach seemingly wanting to put him back on on the starting line, We've seen some variations that first line over last week. We saw Furland on that line. He went out with an injury. We saw Bennett put on that line. And then in the Pittsburgh game, we even saw Brower moved up to the first line for a while. If you were coaching this team, if you're the guy behind the bench, what would you be doing? What version of the first line do you think makes the most sense right now? Is it Goudreau, Monaghan, Furland? Goudreau, Monaghan, Brower? Goudreau, Monaghan, Bennett? Or something completely different? Uh, to spark that line, I'd actually do something a little different and throw Kachuk on there, but you know, and move Bennett up into the 3M line, as it were, and go from there. But I know where you're coming from, and to me, I don't think that being on the second line is holding Kachuk back much. 
I think maybe a little bit. I think it's more valuable to put Bennett there and get him going than I think you would see benefit from putting Kachuk yeah. there. Well, it's just uh, because ever since Kachuk's been put on that first unit on the power play, uh, and the power play has actually been rather successful lately, that I think that that might have like an instant chemistry type of thing going on. So that's the only reason why I try that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I know you're coming from, but I guess when I look at Kachuk's numbers, I go, this isn't a guy you necessarily need to boost. True. You know, I don't think moving him up that little bit is going to change his numbers all that much. But when I look at a guy like Bennett, I'm thinking, wow, this is a guy who could really benefit from being on that first line. True. Um, so if it was me, I would do – I like the chemistry. I mean, I've said to you since the preseason, I like the chemistry of Bennett Goudreau. And – you know, whether Monahan's on that line or not, we could debate all day. We won't. But I like the chemistry of the bennett goudreau Monahan line. I thought Bennett was working harder in some of those games than we've seen him in a lot of other games this year. Yeah. So if it was me, I'd go back to Bennett and, you know, move Furland down to line three and see how he does yeah, there. Actually, I, I I'd think... hit the blender entirely and throw uh, Bennett with Goudreau and Kach- or, uh, Backland in. On that line, Kachuk with Monahan and Furland on the second line, and you know. Yeah, again, this just... this coach barely likes to change his lines. I don't think we can ask for much more yeah. than a winger here or there. True enough. But yeah, I think Bennett's get the uh, on that first line. Throw him in the blender. <laughs> and you know, the, I mean, that's a great discussion for coming in next year of what a new coach might do. But as we've talked about, Gully likes to keep his lines pretty static. So I think just asking for a Furlan Bennett change is the best we're going to get at this point. Yep. But we've tried Brower on that line a few times, never really worked all that well. Um, I think Bennett's a good option there, and I think again of the guys that can benefit from it, you're going to get. You're, we've seen the most benefit from Bennett. Well, Matt, uh, I guess it's time to look ahead. I'm a little nervous to do this right now because of where the Flames are at, but. Let's take a look at the Flames' week. They're on a road trip right now. They played Pittsburgh tomorrow night on the 7th. They head to Buffalo, New York for a 5.30 start time against the Buffalo Sabres. Then on Friday, they go to the train wreck of a team that is the Ottawa Senators right now, another 5.30 start. And then Monday, they're back for the first game of a homestand against the New York Islanders. Again, a 5 p.m. start. So three early games this week. Um... Well, I'm nervous to hear your prediction. Well, intrinsically, you have the two worst teams in the Eastern Conference is as the first But we two. can't even beat the Oilers. I know. Well, that's the thing. And the Islanders are not in a playoff spot either and are only like five points up or six points up on third last. So, like, the none of the teams are very good. So I'm predicting zero points. I think that they're I mean, gonna... on paper, this should be a week that the Flames six pick for up six. six points. Yeah, it should be. I'm going the other direction. They're going to get zero, and the wheels are going to just fall off, and that's it for the season. So, because they haven't done a damn thing to show that they can do anything. So, why well, have faith in the team that they can actually beat the mediocre teams that they should be able to win against? I just think that if we don't beat any of them, it's almost, I don't know, it's too bad. Like, yeah, we're on a four-game win streak. That's going to be a seven-game, or sorry, a four-game losing streak. That's going to be a seven-game losing streak. And then you got Edmonton coming in. That would probably be eight then. Like, I, I don't think this team is a dumpster fire yet. Um, I don't know. I, I have a feeling I don't know which game, but I have to think the Flames are going to win one. And I don't think it's going to be a handed win. I think it could even be an overtime win. But my gut says, and I don't know which one, but the Flames win one of them. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that they get... I mean, even if the team scores on themselves, the other team. Like, I, I just have a feeling the Flames win one of them. Yeah. Well, they need six points. But they needed six points last week, and they got one. So We have 15 games left. By my math, the Flames need to win 10 to make the playoffs. Yeah, give or take. So, um, and just I mean, let's just look ahead. We usually do this at the beginning of every month at the the schedule that's coming up. The Flames have a road trip this week. 
Next week they're at home. They play the Islanders, the uh, Edmonton Oilers, and the San Jose Sharks. Then they have their last back-to-back of the year, again on the road, the Vegas-Arizona series. The Flames are back here against Anaheim. They go back on the road against San Jose. They go back on the road against L.A. Then they have Columbus and Edmonton at home. So about an equal number of home and road games. But I don't know. I mean, we've said for a lot of the season they're playing better on the road. Right now I really don't care where they're playing. I'm not seeing great hockey. Yeah. Well, they have six games against dumpster fire teams that they should beat. And they have six games against playoff teams that they're directly playing against. They need to win nine of those games. And I don't see that in them. So, we'll see. I mean, looking at this, there's five games. Just on paper this month, there's five games immediately I see that I say, yeah, they should win these. Uh, They should win Buffalo, Ottawa, Islanders, both Edmonton games, and the Arizona game. Yeah. And I think this month, too, I mean, we've got Vegas, we've got uh, Anaheim, we've got L.A., this is where you're either going to blow a lot of points to the teams right around you, or you're going to barely squeak in because you beat those teams. And I just, right now, I don't know what to think. Yeah. Well, we'll see how this week goes. And if they, we have a good week, then, hey, our tune will be different. But, you know, we have a lot of reasons to be pessimistic. You know, sometimes when you're playing uh, Hold'em and you're just waiting for your hand to straighten out, I feel like that's where we're at right now. Like, We're not where we want to be, but this week could either straighten this team out or spell the end for this team. I think if they don't win. Yeah, like if the Flames win all three games, then we're likely back in the playoffs. Even if we win two of them. And hey, you know, so it's just we have to see. And it's frustrating, but. If we don't beat Buffalo, don't beat Ottawa, don't beat the Islanders, and then don't beat the Edmonton Oilers, I almost wonder why keep playing. Yeah, exactly. There is a forfeit rule. Just call it the rest of the season. Yeah. Uh, All right, Matt. Well, we will talk to you next week. Hopefully, you can enjoy these uh, three Flames games, and hopefully, we'll have some more exciting news to talk about next week. Yeah. Instead of like having a season wrap up with ten games left to go, <laughs> we'll play taps. We can, you know, have a funeral for the season if that yeah. happens. Take it All easy, right, everybody. Have a good one, my friend. Bye. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.